Good afternoon. Uh, welcome everyone to the Lowy Institute. It's great to see so many new and familiar faces in the audience. Let me start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which the Institute stands, the Gadigal of the Eora Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past and present. I'm really delighted um, to see the enthusiasm and interest in today's event and in this topic, the intersection of Australia's foreign policy and multiculturalism. Please allow me to set the context for today's discussion, which I hope will be a discussion with you at the end. At the end of June, Australia's Foreign Minister, Penny Wong, in Kuala Lumpur said, half of the Australian population was born overseas or has a parent who, were born, who was born overseas. Australia will be reflecting this rich character back to the world so the world can see itself in Australia because we share common ground. The time has come for Australia's full story to be told, our modern diversity and the rich heritage of First Nations people. That was Penny Wong at the end of June. Now, more than a quarter of Australians were, was born overseas, including myself, and almost half of Australians have a parent born overseas, according to our last census. This demographic reality and re diversity ought to be celebrated, but have we moved beyond this demographic reality? Multiculturalism symbolises a positive vision of an inclusive, pluralistic society that supports minority groups based on equality and social belonging. Australian politicians have sought to frame Australia's multiculturalism around its socioeconomic benefits for Australia. As a migration policy tool, multiculturalism has the ability to manage Australia's growing diversity. Multiculturalism is also used as an anti-racism strategy to ensure social justice. And finally, multiculturalism is used to articulate Australia's national identity through a sense of shared values. In relation to the last point, multiculturalism as a grand strategy or objective, Australia's 2017 foreign policy white paper states that multiculturalism is part of Australia's soft power and a source of influence. Since coming into power in May, the Labor government has sought to invoke Australia's multiculturalism as part of our national identity when engaging with the region. Despite the importance of multiculturalism, it is unclear the extent to which various cultural and ethnic groups have shaped and contributed to Australia's foreign policy. How do we build alignment with Australia's multicultural communities and have these communities inform foreign policy making? What are the systems and procedures that need to be in place to do and to achieve this goal? To explore these questions, I'm really pleased to introduce and welcome our panelists. Dr. Melissa Phillips is a lecturer in humanitarian and development studies in the School of Social Sciences at Western Sydney University. She has previously worked for the United Nations and international NGOs in South Sudan, the Horn and North of Africa, and the Middle East. She recently co-edited Understanding Diaspora Development, Lessons from Australia and the Pacific. Next to her is Jason Chai. He is the Director of Market Access and Government Affairs for Cochlear Asia Pacific. Jason is a former Australian diplomat and has worked for Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, as well as at other senior government levels, including the Chief of Staff to a Victorian Minister of Trade and Investment. And next to Jason is Alfred Deakin Professor Fatima Mansouri. He holds a research chair in Migration and Intercultural Studies and the UNESCO Chair for Comparative Research on Cultural Diversity and Social Justice. Fetty is the founding director of the Alfred Deakin Institute for Citizenship and Globalization at Deakin University. He is the editor of the Journal of Intercultural Studies and since 2010 has served as an expert advisor to the United Nations on cultural diversity and intercultural relations. What an esteemed panel. Welcome to Melissa, Jason and Fetty. So in the introduction, I briefly laid out the definition of multiculturalism, how it is understood in the Australian context, and what I see as the problem from the lens of policy making, specifically foreign policy. I'd like us to start broadly um, first and to touch briefly on the idea of uh, multiculturalism as a policy space. So to you, Fetty, first, this idea that multiculturalism as a policy space has been criticised 
by those working with multicultural communities as a shallow policy space. Why is this a case when multiculturalism was introduced to Australia in the 1970s? Thank you very much, Jennifer, for having me. And like you, I would like to acknowledge that we, all, of, all of us are meeting on the unceded land of the indigenous people of Australia, and we pay our respects to all their elders past, present, uh, and future. Um, I, th I think you've alluded to in your introduction to a definition of multiculturalism. Unfortunately, as a scholar who has been working in this space for, for a couple of decades now, there is no agreed definition of multiculturalism. Multiculturalism is essentially uh, started as uh, an ideological idea, which really came immediately post the, the great movements of the 60s, which were the uh, civil rights movements in, in, in Northern America, which really had a strong emphasis on justice along the axis of race, gender, and later on, of course, other, other issues of uh, emancipation for a number of minoritized groups in the West. What, what, what you were also talking about correctly, which is the criticism of multiculturalism as, as a policy, needs to be put in, in some kind of context. Because yes, we moved away from the white Australia uh, uh, nation idea, if you like, uh, until, which persisted till the, till the end of the 60s. And then we embraced a much more pro-diversity approach to two things, really. Pro-diversity approach to integration, of migrants as they come in. So we accepted that as migrants are diversifying in coming to Australia, we as a, as a, as a, as a settler, if you like, emigrant society would also give them the tools with, the, with which they can preserve some elements of cultural identity. And then more than that, we then face the, the issue of how do we affect, if you like, a national policy that is not simply, as you said, a shallow, uh, approach to managing diversity, but, but much more affirming that in, in um, allowing migrant communities to have access to some level of retention of their cultural identities, we also do not close the door for them to access political uh, uh, membership of, of, of the national community within which they happen to settle. So there's that kind of, I look at it more or less at three levels. There's the cultural recognition, which comes through at a very basic level of affirming identity. There is the uh, socio, if you like, economic justice dimension, which is really about resources. Mm -hmm. How do we empower uh, communities uh, through uh, allowing them access to, an equitable access to resources, not uh, equality, but equitable. And then through a political representation, at the political representation level, which means every single Australian is able to have a voice in, in the making of the national story of, of, the, of this nation and state that we have. So in all of those things, the failure or the criticism of multiculturalism has always been at the level of justice and representation. I think we've made huge progress in terms of cultural recognition. There is still some tension within uh, liberalism in general between individual claims and collective claims. And we know that multiculturalism is all about that notion that groups can have collective claims as well. We haven't really resolved that yet. There are some innovations in terms of policies, like the Canadian Reasonable Accommodation Doctrine, for instance. But we haven't really resolved it as yet, but we've made significant progress. We are yet to achieve, in particular, at the political representation level, which is probably of relevance to our discussion today. We have not really made significant progress on that, on that front. So I'd like to come to you, Melissa, um, sort of following on from Fetty's comments. How Australia and successive governments have engaged with multicultural communities They've largely been transactional. So what migrants owe to Australia? Is this the case? And what are the implications of this approach for Australia's foreign policy and our place in the world? Thanks, Jennifer. And thanks for the opportunity to be here today. Absolutely. I think the first thing for us to really question is, what do or what are Australia's multicultural communities? When we think about the number of people who were born overseas, have a parent born overseas, a large temporary and permanent migration um, to Australia, I think that we really need to see multicultural communities as an us. It's not an other. And that's the first important step for us to really see the diversity in Australia on a broad scale. You only look at how long it's taken us to have diversity at federal parliament level to see it's, it's really taken us a long time to accept that this is the, the way that Australia is as a nation. And you're right, through multicultural policies, we've remained at a very 
celebratory and superficial level. The constant criticism that multiculturalism is about food and, and festivals, but nothing deeper. For me, uh, engagement truly with um, our multicultural communities at all levels, it requires understanding their needs and also understanding the different levels of engagement that they want to have. For some people, that might be as diaspora groups engaging on foreign policy. For others, it might be much more micro issues that are relevant to them. I think that we, that recent times during the COVID-19 pandemic, the distance between government and multicultural communities has become greater. You only need to see some of the actions that have taken place around border closures, attitudes and public statements towards people on temporary visas, um, treatment of people in certain high migrant um, LGAs, particularly in, in areas like New South Wales, to show that there really hasn't been a, a true understanding of what multicultural communities are in need. And, and hopefully that can be bridged um, in the future. So thanks um, for sharing those perspectives and sort of drawing upon Jason's work with government across different levels. Um, how has Australia fared so far in drawing upon our diversity and diasporas as sources of soft power and engagement? It's a great question, Jennifer. And look, I don't want to be too glib about it, but aside from MasterChef, I don't think any Australian institution <laughs> has really took representation yes. seriously. Um, we, but I, I am a very, uh, very optimistic about where the future holds. We've just elected a Prime Minister who was raised in Camperdown Flats with an Italian name, with an Italian father and Australian mother. We've just seen those images of Foreign Minister Penny Wong visiting her hometown in, in Kota Ginabalu in, in Sabah, uh, incidentally uh, the place of my, my father's birth as well. Um, and we, we, we can see very clearly that there is a genuine, genuine interest in engaging uh, and, and talking about the multicultural story, as, as you alluded to in your in your opening, there is a you know there's a population and voices and stories which haven't been told uh, externally, and as a result, going back to what you, you were talking about, Betty, about the the white Australia policy, that that policy still kind of resonates overseas. But when you have a foreign minister going to Malaysia, talking about you know this is our multicultural Australia. Just think about a few years ago when we had a prime minister labelling us as the white trash, trash of Asia. With the foreign minister being who she is, born in Malaysia, visiting, representing Australia, I don't think those kind of claims can be labelled uh, for Australia anymore. But I'm, everyone knows about the story about, um, about Penny Wong and, and her commitment to multiculturalism. I wanted to actually sh shine a light also to the assistant minister for, for foreign affairs, Tim Watts who lives in Footscray, one of the most diverse multicultural places in, in Australia, and has been talking about these issues for many, many years. In fact, um, he wrote a book about it, and the book's called The Golden Country. And it, it's a contrast to David Horn, uh, to, to Donald Horn's uh, The Lucky Country, and it talks about how Australia is changing. And The Golden Country is about the, you know, the changing demographics and how this changing demographics can lead to a, a new promise, a new future. He talks about, ironically, uh, John Howard's policies uh, for immigration has led to this change, the greatest change of cultural diversity since you know, the, the bringing down the, the white Australia policy. So I think he's, he's very positive about it. And, and, and I think we should be positive about it as well. We, as you alluded to before, this 47th Parliament is the most diverse, both from a gender perspective, which obviously has played through, and, and that has been very public in the newspapers, obviously with respect to the, the events that have happened over the last two years. But it's also the most culturally diverse uh, Parliament. We have people from Laos, from Sri Lanka, from India, from China, from India, all represented, from Singapore, all represented mm. within this Parliament. And I think that's, that's the... I guess that's the, to, to, to answer your point, Betty, um, that's the political engagement piece that, that, that is now happening within the major political parties. They now, and from Vietnam, they now recognise that pre-selecting people from, 
from that represent the community is a plus, right? Because Australia is different. So I think it's only a matter of time that when those numbers then get reflected in the representation. Yeah. You should get a share of those royalties. Aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's a two way process here. So first, there's a you know what migrants owe to Australia, but also what Australia needs to do. So, so focusing on sort of the function of multicultural communities, this is a question for all or three of you. What function do multicultural communities and their respective organisations serve in Australia's regional or international role as advocates of rules, norms, and democratic values? Hmm. Anyone want to take a first uh, step? Uh, look, I w probably won't try to uh, give you a straight answer to that question, but I, I like the, um, the way you've described Penny Wong's vision for linking multiculturalism to foreign affairs or foreign policy making. And then that will perhaps bring in multicultural communities and, and the role they might do. My, my um, I was sharing with you before this uh, panel discussion that I, I was doing a bit of research on this particular topic and nothing really, not much has been written about connecting multiculturalism to foreign policy making. Uh, there's Penny Wong's speech and there's 1995 Gareth Evans speech Mm -hmm. Gareth Evans' speech, Melissa's. Uh, th that's more in the context of, of, of um, uh, diaspora yeah. and humanitarian uh, action. I'm talking about foreign policy mm. making in general. Yeah. It's yeah. a much more broader area. In between, there's nothing. And, and I, I, can, I can very uh, cautiously characterize Gareth Evans' approach as much more instrumentalist. Uh, Penny Wong's a much more uh, kind of macro scale grand narrative about how to project Australia's identity. But I'm, I'm also very uh, optimist, uh, Jason, but I'm also a realist. Yeah. And wh what I mean by that is I do not believe for a moment that simply because we have the most diverse parliament that all of a sudden the, the nature of diversity governance will change. Mm -hmm. The nature of intercultural, intercultural relations will change. The nature of feeling a sense of belonging mm -hmm. to Australia will change among communities. I'm, 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 I don't buy into that kind of argument. If anything, all the data that we have, and we have all sorts of data, we have data that surveyed big corporations, ASX listed companies. We have data that surveyed uh, everyday experiences of racism, and that's a lot of scholarly research. We have data that looked into historically the changing face and the changing intensity of discrimination in Australia. And I, I, and I, I say, yes, that's a good sign. It's mm -hmm. only a sign. Mm -hmm. But really, structurally, it doesn't do anything as yet. It will only do something about political representation when we project an image of Australia, going back to Penny Wong's speech, when we project an image of Australia, which is truly, truly reflective of who we are as a multicultural society and state. Mm. It's not the same thing. Mm. And multicultural society is a very descriptive label. We are here diverse, ethnically, racially, religiously, whatever. But a multicultural state is a state that functions in a way that reflects the ethos of diversity. That is inclusion, respect, equitable, equitable mm -hmm. respect, which means respect for diversity in a way that allows people the space to, to operate uh, as, as a different individuals, so retaining uh, certain elements of what they feel as part of their identities, but at the same time do not utilize that as an exclusionary kind of label. Many people do not like to be characterized in terms of the color of skin or racial identity, or whatever, but nevertheless, they still want and hold dear to their own uh, uh, self uh, notion of identity, their own cultural heritage. I don't think we are there yet because mm. it, is, it is seriously a societal project. Mm. It is not a political leader mm. project, yeah. even though leadership is extremely important and I applaud this government for making all the right noises but it's not simply a rhetorical question that we can say, hey, this is what we want to happen, and all of a sudden it happens. To give you an example, and I'm sorry if I'm, to give you an example, we introduced in 2012 intercultural curriculum uh, ideas, that is introducing intercultural understanding in curriculum for schools, yeah? Because we, everyone understood that to start this process, you need to start with education as an institution. Since 2012, not a single budget allocation from both sides of politics, by the way, has been made 
to enable the introduction of intercultural understanding as a cross-cutting pedagogical teaching uh, objective in schools. If we don't, and we are not teaching our kids how to operate interculturally, and we're not training teachers to teach effectively in highly diverse classrooms, as Jason was saying, then all of, all of these other things really will not deliver, and we will not project an image of Australia externally, which is truly reflective of that notion of diversity and pluralism mm. that we exhibit internally. So yes, we are making very, very slow progress mm. in terms of the demographic face of our parliament, mm. but no, the, 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 the road is long and arduous, and I would add, requires very courageous leadership, mm. in my view. Any follow-up comments from our panelists? Yeah. A very small one, and it goes to your point about enfranchisement. Yeah. You know, being being included, being uh, part of the conversation, and I, I'm brought back to my days when I was uh, posted in Tokyo, um, and there was a it was around 2000 and 2012, uh, around the time before Prime Minister Abe um, came back as the Prime Minister, and around that time, the context of of Japan was that it was a shrinking population, it was a uh, aging population, and as a result, the, the topic of immigration was very topical. Mm -hmm. And we, the, the ambassador at the time, um, Ambassador Bruce Miller, who many of you would know, um, was hosting a lunch with a very senior minister um, who was uh, responsible for a portfolio area that I was involved in. Um, and while they're having this conversation, um, you know, this minister turned to our ambassador and said, look, what does immigration look like? What, what is the impact of that in Australia? And without skipping a beat, Ambassador Miller said, on my left, I have the daughter of a former foreign minister who's, uh, who advises me on political issues. And on my right, you have Jason, born in Singapore, migrated to Australia with his family when he was very young, and now he advises me on, on environmental issues. I take advice from both of them. I don't discriminate, I take advice from both of them because we are, they represent Australia's interests overseas. And that I think is, is the point about enfranchise. So I think it has to be a, it has to be brought in from every level, that every level that, at every level that there has to be some inclusion and, and acceptance that this is what Diversity means it means better, more, different, um, and and enhancement of I guess Australia's national interests. And I think we ignore it at our peril, right? We know that um, we've seen through recent Senate inquiries that diaspora communities, not all of them, but many of them, are, are keen to engage on foreign policy issues and are doing amazing work. Um, our recent research has highlighted groups like Myanmar diaspora involved in homeland activism. Um, Pacific Islander groups who were involved in remittances. Now, instead of a Penny Wong jetting around the South Pacific trying to get information and intelligence, here we go. We've got diaspora communities that are sitting there actively engaged and, and they're an incredible source of information, advice, um, advocacy that we can tap into. So for, for me, um, it's there, it's happening. We are often slow to recognise the realities of our multicultural communities, as, as the others have been saying. And, um, but, but it is something that a lot of multicultural nations do, do very well, that they see their migrant communities in, in all their different elements of diversity as assets. And this is a huge asset of diasporas that we continue to just overlook. And as I said, we, we do so at our peril. So can we articulate what type of impact Australia's foreign policy might have if we were to acknowledge and incorporate these multicultural voices as key assets in policy formulation? Are there any illustrative examples that you might, yeah. that come to mind? Well, I think Penny Wong's carbon footprint will drop. <laughs> she won't have to jet around. You know, there would be an opportunity to brief um, with those communities that as I said, Pacific, from the Pacific, from, from different groups that we're seeking to engage with on a political level, there, is, there would be information um, that we could, we could gather from communities. We would be able to have a kind of relationship and liaison on, on emerging kind of concerns because 
Diaspora groups have deep connections locally at social, economic, political and cultural levels in a way that no government department ever will. Um, so I think that it would make their job easier. And there is evidence of groups in other countries. As I said, most countries of, of heavy or high migration have managed to do this. Um, whether that's through groups, um, for example, there's Africa, Europe, diaspora platforms, there's specific aid bodies like the Swiss Development Corporation that funds a CSO network that looks at diaspora groups aligned with the 2030 SDGs. We also have the Global Forum for Migration and Development. There are many networks out there. I think one really illustrative example is in the United States where there are communities there of um, people from Darfur that has been in, in conflict in Sudan. And through groups like the United States Institute for Peace, they've been able to develop a kind of liaison and coordination that can facilitate relationships with government, as well as providing them with information about what's going on in a way often that they would not be able to get from, a, from an embassy um, on the ground. Mm. So I think there are examples, there are other countries that we can learn from through um, platforms, coordination groups. Um, there's a whole plethora of examples that are available. Paddy, Jason? Yeah. So I think there's two things to, to really try to disentangle here, right? Um, there is the issue of migrant communities, whether they're diaspora or not, whether they see themselves as mm. diaspora communities or simply transnational communities engaging in affairs of their homelands. And we, as, uh, as Melissa would know, we're just starting a large project that is looking at uh, my diaspora communities' intervention in, in humanitarian crises. We have nine case studies from the Middle East to Southeast Asia. But that is not actually happening within the contours of government policy. That is happening more or less civil society to civil society level. And I just want to distinguish, please, between those two. It's not the same. Mm. In terms of government policy dealing with or incorporating multicultural perspectives in its own uh, views on foreign policy, it is a completely different uh, challenge, I think. And it, my, my, my starting position is this. If we can do nothing, do no harm. And I say this specifically in the context of what's happening right now. You all know the tension in the region, in particular with China. I think if we're not able to really reflect the nuanced understanding of the situation that Chinese Australians can add to the, to, to the governments, really even thinking about how to approach a rising China, then do no harm in the sense that do, no, do not ostracize Chinese Australians. Do not conflate Chinese Australians with China, a rising uh, Chinese power. And unfortunately, we have seen recently, both in media and political discourse, that that conflation is taking place. So if you talk to me about multiculturalism and foreign policy, my starting position is, if you can't do it properly, do no harm in that space. And that harm would happen if we, will, in Australia, our largest, our largest community, more or less the Chinese, in terms of migrant to Australia, if we treat them in a way that we think of them essentially as all we do is just, you know, oh, we, we have this skepticism about China, uh, there's an anti-Chinese uh, kind of sentiment that is really circulating in public discourse. And we've seen it. There's a number of my colleagues who've done research on this. They've documented it. Uh, you, your own uh, polls have, uh, the Lowy Institute, a lot of opinion polls have shown that. Uh, it, it's, it's out there. We know it's happening. And that's where leadership, I think we've spoken earlier about leadership. I think that's where leadership is absolutely critical. First, let's not problematize diversity in Australia. Let's not divide Australians of Chinese descent or exclude them simply because we right now have a very challenging, of course, in terms of foreign policy, very, very challenging dossier in our hands, which is how to handle China and, of course, uh, Russia for in, in, in different circumstances. And then, after, then beyond that, a, a very, very cool-headed conversation needs to be had in terms of what can we, and I don't like to instrumentalize communities too much either in terms of information gathering, but what I would like to know is if foreign policy is about projecting our identity as a cosmopolitan, progressive, diverse, you know, uh, middle power, 
then where, uh, where are the voices of multicultural, uh, multicultural communities in Australia in that articulation of foreign policy? For me, it doesn't, it's not there really. There is no story that has been told that Australia is indeed a very diverse. If you look at foreign policy in terms of those three axes that you've, you've got multilateralism, you've got engagement with, uh, um, uh, sorry, uh, uh, strategic alliances, and then you have uh, nation to nation relationship building. That nation to nation relationship building can happen and can be facilitated and aided through multiculturalism. Forget the other two because they are driven by other political and ideological kind of things. But the third one, dimension, which is nation to nation, strengthening of relationships, that's where we need multicultural communities because they're the best vehicle for enabling that. So I, I want to bring you in here, Jason, um, aside from your master chef anecdote. <laughs> <laughs> how someone who's worked in DFAT, so how would you foresee a foreign policy, um, Australia's foreign policy, uh, having incorporated, seriously incorporated multicultural communities and voices? What would that look like aside from projecting it on MasterChef via TV screens? Look, uh, I think there's, there's, there's several things um, that, that come to mind. The, the projection of foreign policy should not just be about externalising mm. what we think Australia should be or what we think we can sell to the rest of the world. It should be reflective in all our behaviours. And I think there's, there's two areas of foreign, well, domestic policy, which if we were to tap into, would have a tremendous impact on our foreign policy. The first is our international students. We, we receive so many international students into Australia via our, our very good um, tertiary institutions yes. um, that you, you, <laughs> you guys, uh, that we, we have a source of people that come to Australia who want to engage with us, who are interested in Australia. Um, and, and previously, you know, we, we talk about how successful the Colombo plan was. And yes, the, the Colombo plan was fantastic. It started the engagement of people from overseas into Australia and showed them a different world of Australia. And when they went back overseas, they would end up being bureaucrats, senior bureaucrats, and eventually, you know, in, in, some, in some instances in some countries, ministers and prime ministers of countries. Now, that was a really great program back then. We have international students come here, coming here every day, and, and while it is very hard to engage with it, I think we should do, we should put more effort into it, and reflect this diversity and this inclusive and engaging kind of behaviour with them. We don't need to read out lines to them about what Australia is. They live it. They live it every single day. And and when they, when they go back to their countries, they can be great ambassadors, great um, advocates for Australia when they go back to their home countries. I think that, that's kind of one area. Um, to your question about DFAT, um, about, I guess, you know, what, what is happening in DFAT at the moment? I think that there has been a, a marked shift in, in terms of um, appointing ambassadors who have uh, the skill sets in both terms of language and, you know, there's some very high profile uh, senior diplomats who have the language and can engage with their countries, um, including my own foreign, um, former uh, boss, uh, Bruce Miller. But then there's also people of cultural backgrounds which are now being represented overseas. Uh, I guess the case and example, Harinder Sidhu in, in India, Peter Varghese in India, James Che, who went to South Korea, the very first uh, South Korean descent um, ambassador to, to represent in South Korea. And then there are many more. There are many more people of cultural and linguistic backgrounds uh, which are within DFAT. But as, as someone, when I, when, when I guess the email for this particular event went out and some people um, from within DFAT pinged me, they said the, the pool and depth of talent within DFAT is deep. Right? But the, the, uh, the ladder up is very, very narrow. Which, which goes to, I guess, the point about resources. And the Lowy Institute have been talking about resources for many, many years about how if you are serious about a foreign policy that is going to be engaging and, and take on some of these very big issues overseas, then you need to resource DFAT appropriately to actually do that and give more people opportunity to step up. Mm. So that, that's, I guess, the, the, the key message I want to leave everyone with, that this is a big, big thing. 
and it can have a big, big impact. So let's, let's resource it appropriately. So I'd like to now to move towards thinking practically. So I'll quote the Foreign Minister again. Um, last year at the National Security College, she said, the world is multicultural, so is Australia. It's a natural asset for building alignment that we are not deploying. And there are many other examples where she invokes Australia's multiculturalism. But what does this mean in practical terms? So we'll get to resources. Um, but how do we build alignment and have multiculturalism inform foreign policy making? Um, Melissa, you've recently wrote about this. Perhaps you can start us off by walking through a potential model of institution, institutionalising um, multicultural voices in foreign policy making. Sure. Um, and I think I, I wanted just to add, as I was reflecting as, as my fellow panellists were talking, that absolutely not every multicultural community or not every migrant necessarily sees themselves as part of a diaspora or wants to belong to a diaspora or be put in that box. However, I think that the Senate inquiry that looked at um, Australia's relationship on this issue and, and the diaspora organisations received so many um, submissions from local community groups who were desperate to engage on this issue. It was important for them. They wanted to be heard. They may not have absolutely understood exactly what that meant to be a diaspora group and, and what was being asked of them, but there was a hand up. And I think the first thing to do is recognise that there is a hand up, that there are communities that want to engage on this issue. We need to have an enabling policy environment, which we do in many levels. However, one of the things that we identified in our research is that something, a national foreign, a national diaspora policy is, is lacking. Um, there's been white papers that we sort of look through to find out what does this mean about diaspora and what does this reference but absolutely something that clearly articulates um, a, a policy level, I think is going to be critical. And within that, giving people signals about where diaspora sits in federal government arrangements. So again, um, some of the inquiries and some of the submissions to the inquiries noted that diaspora kind of has this uneasy place between DFAT, a little bit of home affairs, a little bit of ASIO now and then, and people kind of don't quite understand where is my diaspora focal point? There were in the past, um, I know, di diaspora desks at DFAT level, but I think having that clearly um, stated so that groups know who they could go to. Similarly, a need for coordination groups and bodies at CSO level, at, at civil society level. Unfortunately, we had until recently Diaspora Action Australia, which was a, a network and a coordination group that recently folded due to mm. lack of funds. And I think, again, that's a, a sad testimony of, of where diaspora has been heading in the CSO space. The other thing related to funding is dedicated funds. Um, Refugee Council of Australia noted in its submission to the inquiry that a lot of funding for multicultural communities sits in the kind of home affairs pot and is about local events, local activities, um, one-off kind of, again, celebratory kind of moments. But actually to be a diaspora organisation and to engage on the level that we're talking about, you might need investment in governance, capacity building, something more sustainable. And there's nowhere to go for those funds. They kind of don't exist. You have to maybe tweak your project to fit the, the title of the, the proposal. So that I think is, is also critical. And finally, those, those networks, those coordination networks. So being able to have ongoing relationships interface between government, CSOs, um, that can represent these issues. Because as Feti said, you know, we have a lot of longitudinal data in the multicultural space and the migration space. I think the diaspora space, again, we, we really don't know what's out there. Groups like Diaspora Action Australia did try to have, you know, um, directories and repositories of information of who's out there, what they want to do, but that's very ad hoc and it hasn't been systematic. So having that kind of coordination network as well will be critical. And I think actually not a big investment for a lot of quick wins mm. is my sense. So Ferdy, you've, also, you've written sort of about the possibility of re reinvigorating Australian multiculturalism. Could be best pursued if conditions are created that guarantee strong political leadership, clear communication with the public and sustainable resourcing across state and federal levels. So put this in a foreign policy context for us, please. So strong leadership, communication with the public and resourcing. 
you're right, because those conditions were actually um, being discussed in the context of other institutions, be it uh, education in particular, but also uh, media, local governance, etc. but not necessarily foreign policy making. But there's no uh, reason why we can't think of um, bringing multicultural perspectives or multicultural inputs into foreign policy making through those three conditions, which are absolutely interconnected and critical. Leadership, of course, uh, as I said, I gave the example earlier, it is an absolutely essential key indicator and signal, both internally but also externally, as to where we stand in relation to our own uh, kind of national identity. I think um, the more we are comfortable with who we are, the easier it is to convince others about who we are. And therefore, the easier it is, we can really have meaningful conversation about all sorts of sensitive issues. Um, and I'm not even here thinking in terms of ge geopolitical issues. I'm even thinking in terms of things to do with the human rights. And uh, there are all sorts of discussions where I, I strongly believe um, uh, an awareness of where we stand, so to speak, is absolutely essential for us to have a credible voice. Many times, I, especially with my association with the UN and UNESCO, many times when I go overseas and I speak overseas and I speak positively about diversity and multiculturalism mm. in Australia, many, many times people stop me and say, hang on, what about indigenous Australians? What are you guys doing there? How come you still don't have anything like, uh, like recognition in the constitution, not to mention treaty, that's even that. So I think people externally are aware of our mm. own shortcomings. So this is leadership. Putting our own, horse, uh, our own house in order is absolutely essential. And this is why we're all very hopeful that this government might actually do something about constitutional recognition and, and uh, uh, giving voice to indigenous communities, because that will be an absolutely positive signal we send to the world externally. So that's leadership. But again, I mentioned China, uh, Australians of Chinese descent. It's the same. Leadership here is absolutely essential uh, to say, no, no, they are Australians, Australian citizens, and we will treat them as any other Australian citizen when it comes to some of these uh, difficult times we are seeing in the region. Uh, so that's leadership, is really, it sets the tone, if you like, for these conversations. And if you have, uh, we, we see it internationally too, you see Trump in, in the US and how really driven a particular agenda in terms of foreign policy making, which is isolationism and a, an extremely narrowed version of nationalism, populism, et cetera. So I think that's all very dangerous, of course, in terms of building um, um, you know, meaningful interactions with, with other societies. The other, the other two which are equally important, and, and I think resourcing, uh, I mean, my colleagues have just spoken about, about uh, resourcing, uh, there's nothing, nothing can be achieved in any sector. And I gave the example of ICU, intercultural understanding in schools. Nothing can be achieved if it's only just a slogan, mm. if it's if manifesto. Yeah. Uh, we've been arguing, we've been lobbying for a federal multicultural act. We still don't have one. We do not have in Australia a federal multicultural act. Canada had it since 1988. And we said, what is stopping us from getting a federal multicultural act? Because I strongly believe having a federal multicultural act will really enshrine resource allocation for this kind of agenda. So we don't see a, a, a network as important as Australian diaspora network basically folding, shutting, shutting door because of, of lack of, of, of funding. So that is extremely important. And then training, it, I, 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 I can uh, sympathize with Jason because having diplomats, for instance, or having Senior, senior bureaucrats who are competent, competent not just linguistically but cross-culturally competent, mm. who can see things from a different cultural point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you, you, look, let's, let's face it. We don't live in a, a single monolithic world when it comes to values, when it comes to how cultures perceive certain issues. I mean, there, there are a lot of uh, cultural uh, concepts, cross-cultural concepts, which typologize communities along, along the lines of a number of uh, key concepts. For instance, individualism, collectivism. The extent to which certain communities want to approach problems from a collective kind of thinking point of view, whereas some other cultures value individual kind of uh, st individual standing out and coming up with, 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 with the solutions. We need to pay attention to that. The 1956 
tripartite war in the Middle East was, was triggered, amongst many other reasons, by a big failure of cross-cultural communi cross communication. Not understanding the signals that President Nasser at that time was sending. So having people who read and are literate cross-culturally is extremely important for decision-making at that level. So yes, leadership, as I said, uh, allocating proper resources so we don't see critical organizations uh, not having the enabling tools to do what they want to do, and ensuring that those who speak on our behalf, and I say this and I mean it, diplomats speak on our behalf whenever they open their mouths internationally, mm -hmm. those, those individuals need to be nuanced in understanding the context within which they speak when they are overseas, when they post it overseas or engage in the, in, with, with multilateral, multilateral institutions. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, I've, seen, I've, seen, uh, dipl I've seen foreign diplomats internationally uh, in, in the UN system when I, was, um, when I took residency there. And I've seen very, very below par speeches, I must say. And, I've, uh, and I've, yeah, that wasn't uh, a moment of glory for me. So I want to come to you last, Jason, before I open the floor to our um, audience here. So having heard from Melissa and Jason as possible systems and procedures uh, to put in place to incorporate the voices of multicultural communities um, in shaping foreign policy. Is it all too far-fetched, um, given the security and geopolitical realities that Australia finds itself in today? Look, as I started my, my speech, I guess, I guess I'm an optimist. I don't think it's too far-fetched. I think it's not beyond Australia's um, skills and abilities to, to incorporate everyone inside the conversation. Um, I think there are, as has been pointed out by Feti and Melissa, there are obviously some challenges in respect to, I guess, institutional kind of changes um, in, in incorporating their voice within the broader politic. That, well, but we're seeing shifting sands on that and, that, and that's a good thing. And there are, you know, all the words coming out of this new government and, and are reflective of our parliament suggests that, that, you know, there is genuine goodwill on that front. Um, then there's also, I guess, the, the, the next piece about uh, trust. You know, it's, it's one thing for us to be projecting what we think the rest of the world wants to hear about Australia. It's another thing to show them what Australia is. And when you look outside, when you walk up and down the streets of Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, you see Australia is different. This is what Tim Watts is talking about. Australia is a different country. And because of that, we need to be able to tap into that because to, to use, a, I guess, a, a, a recent example, um, the Australian government invests a lot in its soft diplomacy, including some, some very great programs, including the spe, uh, special visits program of senior politicians who come to Australia, but also the international uh, media visits. Uh, Post in, in South Korea wanted to show um, South Korean journalists, uh, and Australia that was excelling at and health and life sciences. They contacted Cochlear and said, would you mind showing them, you know, the Cochlear implant, this, this company that I work for, um, a, a cutting edge, world leading uh, medical device that helps young children hear when they're born profoundly deaf with a congenital hearing loss and through this implant, they can hear again. Now, when this traveling um, band of journalists came out to, to, to New South Wales, we showed them. Um, we showed them the manufacturing facility at Macquarie University. We showed them how the, the implants put together. But we also brought in Erin, a recipient uh, of our cochlear implant, who's nine years old, implanted at the age of three, and now leads a, a life in a mainstream school in North Ryde. Now, this story would be just any other story about Australia being Australia. But what made it really special was that Erin was a South, was a, an Australian born girl to two South Korean international students who'd lived in Australia. They talked about Erin's mum, talked to these journalists and talked to them about how incredible the, 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 the surrounding health system has been for, for Erin. That because of the support that they've received through the Australian government, um, programs, that Erin's life is very different had she been born in South Korea. Her father uh, 
relayed the fact that had she been in, born in South Korea and had we settled in South Korea and had Erin, they'd probably be out, out of pocket about $200,000. Now, this is the kind of burden that, you know, um, that, that is very, very difficult. But she, they were able to convey to South Korean journals in, in Korea how their lives are different, tangibly different, because they were born in Australia. Now, I think that's a really powerful point, that Australia is different and is inclusive and, and gives these people a, a new opportunity in life. And when, when these journals went back to, to South Korea, they wrote stories about Erin. You know, they wrote stories uh, about Erin because in a very subtle way, they were able to convey what, what Australia actually represents, a fair go, um, that we don't leave anyone behind, that no matter where you're from, you, you'll be taken care of if, you, if you're born, unluckily born with a, 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 you know, a, a congenital disease like this. But I think that, that's the, the bit where there is a, a level of truth that we have to engage with, with internationally. And it's not just about us telling stories, it, it's about actually living it. Well, thank you. Um, so we have just a little under 10 minutes for Q&A. Um, maybe I'll take two questions at a time for the sake of efficiency. So if you could just um, say who you are um, and wait for the mic to come to you. There's two now. Yeah. Oh. Here and um, the gentleman in the middle there. Hi, my name is Kuhn. I'm an executive coach. And I just want to commend the panel here that Louis put together because it wasn't that long ago that Robert Menzies um, hosted an event on foreign policy dialogue and AsiaLink was included in that. However, from my representation point of view, it is rather disappointing when they're talking about the comparison of, you know, Australia international policy and how much it has changed from the 1950s and yet the photo is incredibly disappointing to see. Um, so well done to the three panel here and to the... And I suppose my question is, given that we kind of barely understood the benefits and the advantages of multiculturalism and foreign policy, what then really gets in the way mm. amongst our political leadership and our bureaucrats? Right. Yeah. And I'll just take one more question. Um, the This gentleman in the middle here. Hi, my name is Dick Lim Amrita. Yeah, okay. Uh, when you talk about the diaspora, who who do you take uh, 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 the, uh, into account? Take the Chinese community where I'm from, and Jason is also. It is so diverse. People come from uh, last century, <laughs> the mine, uh, uh, the gold, to the gold mines, to the 70s, uh, uh, Colombo plan, people who stayed back, and later on, a lot of mass migration, especially from Malaysia, Singapore, and Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. Now, our interests are so diverse from the mainlanders, nothing in common. I know more about Britain than I know about China, even though I'm Chinese. So, and, and, and it is so monolithic. Who do you consult? And, and I know so many of the organizations, a lot of them hated each other, <laughs> honestly. And a lot of it are ruled by old, old men. Like you have old white men, but they have old Chinese men. And it is hard for the younger people to, to get into. So when you do your consultation, do you go there? And they, a lot of them are very not represented by female, mm. very, very, very few. Where are their, their, their voices? So that's why we also talk, sorry, I, I'll finish, uh, you know, uh, the, the Morrison government lost the election because of, the, as Jason said, the, the extreme uh, anti-China feeling. Not because all of us are pro-Chinese, but we, can, we, we, we cannot send that racist, mm. you know, so implication of what... Uh, the, the, the coalition government was doing. Thanks. Thank you. So um, maybe quick fire responses. Yeah, yeah, sure. So thank you for your point. I think what you're drawing us um, to, to the gentleman who just asked a question is that these communities are not homogenous. They're mm -hmm. incredibly diverse. And we, could, we are incorrect if we talk about the Chinese community. It's Chinese communities. Mm. Um, I think the point about where are the new generation and the next generation 
also highlights the need for resourcing around building capacity, looking for talent, making sure that everyone has space to be heard and representative groups or groups that can support that are key. Now, I, hope I had so many thoughts about your question. I, I, I absolutely think that there's political will, as we've talked about, what's, what's holding it back. But I think there's also just an inability to recognise the diverse nature of Australia's community. I live in Canterbury, Bankstown. I love it, but that is what my Australia looks like. And I wish everybody understood the same as me. I think that there is a, a lag, in a way, at, our, um, at Canberra. Um, we've talked about the Canberra bubble, and I think that that reflects a, a visioning of what Australia is. Um, that's my quick fire answer. Just a quick, again, just to add to your, um, uh, uh, answering your question, in terms of the what, diaspora, you're absolutely right. It, mm. it is a term that's uh, a little bit fuzzy and imprecise, and, and I, I personally am very critical of the term. I, I prefer to distinguish it from my migrant communities in general so that you don't end up, um, as uh, Melissa said, homogenizing uh, communities. But more importantly, um, why, if, if, it's, if, it's incorpora if, if incorporating multicultural perspectives is so good, why aren't we doing it? My take on that is, I go back to what I said earlier, it's because we have not really elevated our engagement with diversity to the level where we are genuinely operating as a multicultural state. We are only a multicultural society operating at a very shallow level. Mm. And I, though I'm very opti optimistic, of course, Jason, mm -hmm. but I don't think we've allowed multiculturalism to really penetrate key institutions. So to give you an example, I earlier mentioned ASX companies which have been surveyed by the Australian Human Rights Commission and also university senior exec. On both, on both occasions, the senior leadership of ASX companies is almost 90 something percent white, Anglo-Saxon white uh, dominated. University senior exec, that's vice chancellors, et cetera, uh, I think 98% uh, uh, or 97% are essentially come from a particular background, uh, which excludes the 50% Australians who the latest ABS census has told us come from different. So we really, we are talking the talk, but I'm sorry, we're not walking the walk yet. Jason, any quick fire response? The quick fire response yeah. um, to your, to, to Kuhn's question, I think it is a, uh, to, to what Melissa, Melissa said, there is a time lag and, and, and time will catch up. I think the world is changing. I think it will, will eventually happen. That was a reflection 50 years ago. 50 years ago, Australia is very different. Now we're, we're in a completely different space. In respect to your question, in respect you know, about multicultural communities and diversity of views, completely agree. But there is, there is definitely a, a diversity of view out there in terms of these various kind of organisations, and they don't agree on things. And quite often, it's a very hard... Um, piece to actually engage with that thing. But there are some communities which have a very solitary view, um, and I, I guess one, one community uh, in particular is, is, is the Jewish community. They, they come through with a very clear voice, very united voice, very unified voice in respect to how um, some subjects are, are dealt with, and, and both parties um, in respect to how they, uh, uh, I guess, engage with this particular community can hear their voice very, very clearly. So I guess it's, it's, it's part of, it's, it's, not, it's not just a one-way street. It's an incumbent on everyone to actually say, all right, how, if we want to affect change, how do we actually bring some common ground on how we come forward with a view that will actually have an impact and, and, and do that internal kind of co you know, coalition building and caucusing to, to figure out exactly what views are, are common and then come forward with a view. Because uh, you know, the, the very best of intentions in terms of engagement will fall on on rocks if there is no clarity about the, the message that's coming through. I know we're coming up to time, but I do want to hear two quick questions, so keep it short and question format, please. Anyone? This gentleman and um, the lady here at the front, please. Uh, hi. Um, I'm a retired naval officer from Bangladesh Navy. Um, I'm trying to actually understand the main message of this uh, seminar uh, or discussion from the panels. So, yes, uh, it is uh, accepted Australia has become a multicultural society. It's no doubt. Mm -hmm. So what's next? Uh, is the, ha the professor very rightly um, pointed out the, how far we have penetrated inside the society. So this is a pocket. So this society here, here, here. But are they all integrated? So the, here lies the problem. 
it will be very difficult for me to be integrated with this society. But for my next generation, possibly it's a little bit easy, not a little, very easy, what I have observed so far. The low, that's why I am trying to understand the actually what we are going to achieve from this multicultural society until and unless it is being integrated. Now coming to your today's uh, uh, discussion, the from the uh, from the multiculturalism perspective, the Loy Institute carried out a survey where the Australian uh, people. The dislike towards Chinese people has mm. come to 80% or higher, I think. They will, it's much, much higher than before. Uh, at least during the pandemic, it has increased. So if I take uh, the Chinese perspective to uh, identify a foreign policy, it will not be liked by the Australian society. It will be quite contradictory, hopefully, I, 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 I guess so. Uh, so that's what I am trying to understand and your panels, your views, please. Thank you very much. And uh, last question here. Hi, Johanna Pittman. I run Advance. This is the organization oh. of Australian diaspora. Yeah. So the Australians who are living overseas and it's an interesting interconnection between diaspora that have moved here and, and Australians who have moved overseas. Um, drawing on Jason's point around the soft diplomacy of Australians when we go overseas, we're seeing a much increased proportion of our global Australian award winners who are from culturally and linguistically diverse uh, backgrounds. So these are mostly next generation uh, Australians who have gone overseas. And also in the new Colombo plan of Australians going overseas, enormous number of um, people from migrant backgrounds and so I'm wondering about how we, in a way, do we just have to wait to see this multicultural um, perception of Australia spread across the world? Or can we do some more? And where we're seeing the opportunity, particularly for going overseas is and building your career overseas, is that the, for those that have been in Australia many years, so the first generation, very underrepresented as Australian expats overseas. Mm. And so there's an opportunity there to say not only the younger generation, but also those who may be approaching retirement, there might be opportunities there. And what a face for Australia mm. that would present to the world. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Any five word answers? Uh, I, I was going to applaud you for one thing, but you disappointed me towards the end. Uh, but you're not going to use expat, the term, but you did use it, I think, yeah? So which is really, for me, quite the way we think about outbound, inbound. So everyone who comes here is a migrant. Australians go work overseas, they're expats. I think that in itself is very problematic for me. Mobility is the same. People move for the same reasons, in, in, inbound, outbound. So I think even the language sends very strong messages about how we view these things. Um, but just to go back to your quest question, I think, which is really, I mean, what is the takeaway message from today's panel, and where, where do we want really take this whole thing. Again, my view is while I remain very optimist, I'm not really someone who doesn't uh, want to look at the positive side of things, but truly for us to make inroads so that your, second, uh, your kids and the generation after them will not be having the same discussion, mm -hmm. we do need institutional change. Mm -hmm. Not just rhetoric, not just sporadic allocation of money here and there. We need to look at, because diversity is an, is an ethical orientation. Right, and so once we embrace that through education, governance, media, uh, go etc., then it becomes part of part and parcel of what we do. And we will not need to look at communities, as the other gentleman said, as specific communities that we need to talk with them. It becomes part of how we operate, and I don't think we are there yet. I think I will leave it on that very fine point, Fatty, and thank you all to our audience and to our panelists. If you can join me in thanking them. Thank for you.